It's a Star Wars theme. And yes, so today we're going to have the force with us. And so it's going to be very, very interesting. I'm, I'm not taking something out specifically from the movie. I'm going to play on the name Star Wars. And we're going to go into the Bible and look at what the Bible speaks about stars. Um, I'm not sure if a lot of people are aware of this, but star worship was a big thing. It's not only was a big thing, it is a big thing. If you open your newspaper, we all read, some of you read the horoscope to see if your wife's going to like you this month and what the lotus numbers are for, for next month and all those, those wonderful things. And I'm not criticizing what you guys are reading. I'm just saying it's still a thing. It's still a thing. And if it's a thing in our time, it was even a bigger thing in the Bible's time. And the Bible gives these hints about what happens in the stars. If I had to recall probably the fondest message about these star type of things, it's what Paul Past you unministered when it comes to um, was it Revelation 12? Revelation 12, where this the, this the story in the Bible speaks about this dragon and this son of God being birthed and what the heck is going on there? Um, and Pastor John explained how that kind of links up with constellation in the sky. And so we pick up on this. The reason why the stars are so prominent because that is that was the loudspeaker for people back in the past. That's how we figure out how seasons work. That's how we figure out the rotation of the earth. It all happens in the stars, and it's almost like there's a hidden message in the stars. Now, before you guys get scary, because I know it sounds a little bit sci-fi, it's going to be sci-fi a bit this morning, but I can guarantee you that I'm not speaking nonsense. I'm going to take out the text, and I want to take you on this journey as we explore what the Bible speaks about this. Outside the church, there's something called astrotheology. Astrotheology, it's literally the worship of the stars, and it's not only um, new to us, but it's, it's been coming quite, quite some time. But there's actually a theological term for this, and it's astrotheology. So you guys are welcome to go check that out if you want to Google some sources with regards to that, if you find topics like this interesting. So, let me jump on. On the 25th of December, 2021, the James Webb Space Telescope was launched into space. Now, we all know about the Hubble Telescope. Okay, we know, You know about the word about the International Space Center. We know the Hubble Telescope. But just a while ago, a new high-definition telescope was sent up into space. And this thing is phenomenal, okay? It's really, really good. You can almost see Paul waving from heaven down to us. It's that good, okay? <laughs> Obviously, I'm talking nonsense. But it's really good. It's, it, it's really good. I, I want you to show, and this comes from NASA's website. Now, before you guys figure, what the heck has this got to do with the Bible? It's got everything to do with the Bible. And so just give me a couple of moments just to get there. The James Webb Space Telescope is the world's premier space science observatory. In other words, what NASA is saying is you don't get any better than this. This is phenomenal technology. Next one quickly. Webb will also will solve mysteries. Pick up on these words will solve mysteries in our solar system. I want you to, I highlighted the word mystery because mystery pops up in our Bible quite a lot as well. Yeah. Mysterious. Science fiction-y. And it's biblical as also. Awesome. And it's going to look beyond distant worlds. Our minds cannot understand the magnificence of the universe that we live in. I get lost traveling to Tiger Valley Center, and outside Cape Town, the rest of South Africa is just Johannesburg. I don't know. I know Cape Town. I know Johannesburg. I don't know. Some people say this. There's Limpopo, KwaZulu, Natal. I didn't even know it existed in South Africa. I mean, I just thought South, um, Cape Town and Johannesburg. In any case, beyond distant walls, there's this massive universe out there, and here's the biggest, funniest part of it all. We have no clue what's happening out there. As smart as we are here on earth, or as smart as we think we are, with all the technological advancements, we have no idea what's happening out there. We see things, they, have, they theorize about some things, and some of us went on a professional course on the Big Bang Theory, so we are very clued up on what happened, Big Bang Theory. Okay, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I get you guys only watch seven long. Don't worry about it. Okay. Any case, so we've got this distant world, this complex things, and, and we, we're very arrogant in ourselves. That we know how the world works. We know what happened. We've got this confidence in ourselves. Well, let me tell you, we are stupid. Yeah. First of all, let me, just, let me just say this quickly. If God created the world, which we inside the church believe he did, 
How arrogant to think that we're going to stand things, and we're just going to understand it by taking a picture. It's arrogance. It means that we elevate ourselves. And if God did not exist, I mean, if God does not exist, just read the papers of the people who don't believe God exists, and they will tell you, we have zero clue what's happening out there. We're theorizing a couple of things. We're writing some papers. We have some hints on what's going on. But the world is too big for us to understand, and they're trying to look and see what happens. And it gets beyond distant worlds around the other stars and probe the mysterious structures and origins of our universe and our place in it. This is not church language. This is NASA's language. But it's interesting to see how these languages pop up in our Bible as well. And you can see I'm a little bit excited about this. In any case, what have I told you about this telescope we, we're talking about? That we can literally take pictures from the past. What if I told you there exists a camera that can take a picture of something that happened thousands of years ago? And don't leave it, okay? I'm not crazy, okay? I didn't smoke anything in the week. I'm, not, I'm, going, to, I'm going to show a couple of things. Some of you might be offended. It's not my intention to offend you. It's my intention to tell you how things are and then to preach a little bit about that. So in order to, to explain this, I need to show you something, okay? This telescope that went into space, the high definition one, the images came back in this week, in this week, okay? And the new idea, and one of the pictures that NASA put actually puts up. Yep. Well, thank you. So, what we are going to do this morning, Ian, okay, this one is working, okay. <laughs> uh. So, the pictures came back in this week, and it's this. I have no idea what we're looking at. Some stars, some dust, some explosions and things happening, but here's the phenomenal thing, and this is where I'm going to break you a little bit, but please don't throw me with the stones yet. NASA claims that what we are looking at is literally a picture of billions of years ago. Billions of years ago, okay? Now, before you get angry, and what about the Bible? I'm going to talk about that in a second. I want to explain something to you, okay, how this works. The speed of light is my next slide, yes. The speed of light is about 300,000 kilometers per second. That's slightly faster than what my salary goes out the moment it comes into my bank account. Slightly faster. Slightly. Can I go, Amen, Kreel, Diana, brothers and sisters? True story. Sad but true. Okay. Now, to give you an idea, I'm phenomenal in maths. So, the circumference of the earth is about 40,000, plus minus 40,000 kilometers. It's actually 40,075 or something like that. That's the circumference of the earth. So, if you can multiply very quickly, the light travels so fast, it can walk around the earth about seven times in a second. Seven times. Can you imagine the motion sickness you would get <laughs> if that would, that would happen? That's how fast light travels. Okay, But because our universe is so big, you can stay um, on this, yeah, stay on this slide. By the time the telescope picks up the light, we are looking at something that's literally billions of years old. Now, I'm going to explain this to you before you leave, okay? I'm, I'm going to show this to you. So, let me say I'm a stationary light source, and I explode and I emit light. I'm traveling at 300,000 kilometers per hour. But the telescope is by the, the, uh, second, um, by the, by the, um, by the drama camera, okay, by the tank room there. Okay, now I'm still traveling. The reason why we can't see the speed of light on earth is because we are so close. You cannot see with your eyes 300,000 kilometers per second. But because the universe is so large, it takes time for the light that happened over there to reach the telescope over here because the universe is so large, okay? So th this is, not, I'm, I'm not making things up, this is, this is scientific fact, okay? So by the time the universe is so big, by the time the light hits our telescope, this is a picture of what happened in the past. Am I confusing you guys a little bit? Okay, okay. Yeah, uh, please fact, fact check me on this and you guys can Google this. So we can literally take pictures of the universe and see things that happened last year, the year before, depending on how far the stars are, because this is based purely on maths 
and science. And so we see pictures, and what we see today is not what's happening right now in the distant universe. I'm not talking about um, the sun and the moon. It's very close. So the light comes and it hits us immediately. But if you travel far enough, light takes time to reach you. Now, this is difficult to comprehend because it's so fast and so large, but it happens with the, so the, the speed of sound as well. So that's something, because sound travels a little bit slower than light, we can understand the delay when it comes to an uh, uh, airplane breaking the sound barrier. Okay. Why am I sharing these things with you? Because science is awesome, and I want to show you what the Bible speaks about light and stars and all these wonderful things about this. But there's a problem with this, with our traditional church mind. What about Genesis? Because I just showed you a picture that proves to you on scientific fact. I'm not talking about assumption. I'm not talking about wondering. I'm talking about the rules that are based on earth. By the rules that are based on earth, the, the scientific laws, those stars need to be so far away. And it had to travel so much amount of time to reach us. So is the Bible lying? What, what about Genesis? How is this possible? Because every church Christian says, ah, oh, but the, universe, oh, the world has been created 6,000 years ago. Um, that, that's not the only problem with this idea about Genesis. What about dinosaurs as well? Because this is another complex idea. Because how do we reconcile what the scientific world is saying with what we are finding out in the Bible? Uh, and by the way, where people quote where dinosaurs are, are picked up in our Bible, it's not dinosaurs. It's speaking of gods. It's speaking of divine creatures. It's, it's not dinosaurs. There's, there's no concrete proof of dinosaurs. And if the world started 6,000 years ago, the dinosaurs had to live in this time because that's when God kind of created it. So it messes up our theology. Please don't leave yet. Okay, I'm not done yet. We, we got, we're building something. Yeah, it gets even worse because what about the genealogies? Because the, 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 uh, we have this time frame from Adam to Abraham and how does these things work? And we give an exact number and we calculate this number to say, okay, because from Adam to Jesus it was about so many years. And then we look at our calendar and we say, okay, the world is about 6,000 and something years old according to the genealogies in the Bible. But then again, inside the church community, we have people standing up and talking about the genealogies and saying, listen, well, hold up. Maybe people did not get 900 years old as the Bible is saying. Is the Bible lying? No, no, no. They're using metaphor. They're using language that they use in their culture in their time that was acceptable and it had symbolic meaning. And this is not people speaking about this outside the church. It's people inside the church, God-fearing theologians that's picking up on these hints. When, people, when the Bible speaks about they turned 120 years old, it didn't mean they got 120. It's a figurative form of living a perfect life. Yeah. We've said this many times. If, if this is confusing you, it's because we read our Bible in our language because it's the only thing that we can understand. But you have to understand the original intent of the author. I mean, we feel a little bit offended about this, but it happens outside the Bible. I get so frustrated when I read that the Bible is lying. No, no. The people outside the Bible that lived the same times did exactly the same thing. When you look at the war journals of the people that existed around the same time of Israel, their kings did exactly the same thing. They exaggerated their numbers because it was culturally accepted and understood within the society that they lived in. We live in a scientific time, and because one plus one does not equal two in the Bible, we say, look, they are lying. No. You can't apply our rules to the way that they wrote the Bible. It's different set of rules. The Bible is not lying. The Bible was written to a different culture that did not even understand the concept of germs. Now, what about all these things? Oh yeah, is the Bible, I forgot about that one. Is the Bible a conspiracy theory? What about all these things? The world is a little bit older or what? The point being here, the bottom line that I'm trying to explain to you here is that <laughs> we must be careful to take the Bible and apply it as a scientific book. Because that is not the intention of the writer. Now I know 
I can see you guys are getting a little bit concerned about what am I preaching this morning. I'm not against the Bible. I believe the Bible. I follow the Bible. They're not lying. They've been writing to a different society. So when we look at the space being larger, we need to understand that the way that we've been interpreting the Bible might have been misguided, might have been slightly little bit different than what we are used to because people are saying 6,000 years old. But now when scholars are studying the Bible, they notice, but it's not as clear as the general population have been making. The smart people, they're studying the Bible and notice that, man, there's more to the story than what we get. And it's bigger than what we understand. Now, I don't want you to... Guys, to get angry, I'm not calling the Bible a liar. Do not misquote me on this. Um, I'm just trying to build up this concept that, you know, I think we need to be careful to be so self-righteous inside the church. Sometimes we criticize people outside the church because they come with logic and we come with fantasy and we say, oh, ours is better than yours. No, 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 we need to stop. We need to listen. We need to look because the world is more complex than what we think it is. The world is much more greater than what we think it is. Now, to speak about the genealogies, the dinosaurs, and Genesis, those are <laughs> weeks and weeks of trying to explain certain concepts. So my intention was not to confuse you. My intention is to tell you that there's more to it than just opening your Bible and reading it into, in your language. That's what I'm trying to explain. I don't want you to get this idea that the Bible is an easy book. It's a very complicated book. But the truth in it is plain. And that's what we're going to talk about. It's not my intention to confuse you. And if anybody would like to come speak about this afterwards, I would love to spend some time and explain this. But due, due to time's sake, I'm just going to carry on um, just to progress. Mandela, my time is not on. Okay, next one. There is so much more to the universe that is yet to be discovered. And you get the next part I already said, but you can just um, go to the next one for me, please. Let's just assume for a second that we aren't as smart as we are. We think we are, and this is a little bit offensive. Now, from this beautiful build-up about not being sure and being confused about a certain things and the space and the distance, and I, I think I've, it's, it's just too much to bear for one morning if you haven't been exposed to this, I'm going to take you to something that Paul wrote about. And we're going to look at what he said, and I'm going to digress a little bit as I'm going to speak about this, but I want to build back to this Star Wars type of theme, um, and then we're going to just go with the flow. Um, yeah, Romans 10, verse 12. Now this is Paul speaking. For there is now, there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is the Lord of all, bestowing His riches on all who call on Him. Now, Paul is going to break our mind in a second, but first he's offending the people he's writing to. I'm not going to um, speak about that, but you can jot down these notes and you can go study this a little bit. About Jew and Greek, there's no distinction between Jew and Greek and extremely offensive to the nation of Israel that he's writing to. And then the next one, he says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Interesting that he would use this because um, it's used in Acts as well. Just after, um, as the church is born, Peter uses the scripture to explain what is happening after the day of Pentecost. I don't have time to explain this to you. I'm just mentioning those nuggets. Next one quickly. How then will they, um, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? In other words, everyone can be saved. There's no distinction between Jew and Gentile. And now Paul argues with himself and says, but how on earth do people get saved if they don't believe? And how are they to believe in him if they've never heard about the gospel? And how are they to hear if there wasn't even someone that was busy preaching to them? It's going to link up with the science type of thing now in a second. He carries on. So he's giving this kind of, kind of answer to God saves everyone, and then he questions his own answer. And he says, how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. So Paul is writing this, and he says it's confusing because everyone can be saved, but how on earth is everyone saved if they did not, did not get us? Carries on. I just want to give you the context of this. Um, you can go to verse 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? 17. So faith comes from hearing 
and hearing through the word of Christ. This is a very familiar section. Uh, we know this verse, but I'm just giving you the context. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed, they have. In other words, have they not heard about the gospel? They haven't heard about this gospel. How do people believe in God if they did not hear anything about God? If they just had to go through the world, just figure things out, how on earth? Now he quotes, and he says, Their voice has gone out all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. What on earth is he speaking about? So his answer to this, but how do people believe? He quotes a Psalm 19. He's giving his answer, okay? Now let's jump to this Paul quoting David, and let's look at what Psalm 19 says. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Paul is writing to us this idea that when we look up, it should change something on the inside. Because what is up is so phenomenal, it makes us feel so small. Now, with our modern telescopes, we're looking at the sky, fantastic, fantastic. And we all get the sense, and, and when, you, when you follow scientific journals, you always get the sense that people's got this idea, there must be something greater out there. They don't talk about God, they don't talk about divine, they just have this feeling of insignificance when you zoom out and you see the magnitude of the universe out there. And Paul quotes David, and David says, but it's the heavens that's shouting at us and says, there's something bigger than what we think is happening. There's something bigger than paperwork and receipt and admin and the normal aspects of life. The world is so big, it doesn't make sense that we are here. Carries on in verse 2. And day to day pours out speech. He's talking about the heavens. And listen to this. And night to night reveals what? The heavens reveals knowledge. Ladies and gentlemen, we are where we are today as a, as a human race, not because of our intellect, because the stars have been giving us hints about what is happening. Now, does this sound a little bit weird for you? <laughs> our calendar, our concept of time, our concept of seasons, our concept of planting and, and sowing, all these concepts simply happen because people looked up and they begin, began to see patterns. They began to see structure. And it's almost as if the stars have been speaking to them. To us, this is, I'm talking rubbish to you guys. But how do you think science started? How do you think we are where we are today? Because people looked up. And they notice things in the universe. And here's the weird thing. Living in a time when society was confused, where, where the, the oceans was an evil place. For us, it's the ocean. For them that did not have technology, that's where bad things happen. That's where monsters stayed. This is not sci-fi. This is worldviews that the people who wrote the Bible in was raised in. Are they lying? Are they talking nonsense? No. If you do not understand the signs of the ocean, it's scary. I know how a plane works. I'm still freak bang when I'm up there in the sky. I love God and all, but that rapture thing, I don't like that in the Bible, you know. You know? Maybe you can like I'm happy here. My Skype of it's from And the night it reveals this knowledge. Guys, this is in the Bible. I'm not talking mythology. I'm talking people who followed God picks up on this carries further. And there is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not in a, In other words, I mean, when someone speaks, you are going to hear. What David is saying, when you look up, you are going to see something, and it's going to be bigger than yourself. Yeah. Verse 4. And their voice goes out, and this is the piece that Paul quotes, to explain how, how can everyone be saved? How do we fix this if people did not hear, and if people did not, a preacher was in there, he says, for their voice goes out through all the earth. And the words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun. Next. Which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber. And like a strong man runs its course with joy. Verse 6. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them. And there is nothing hidden from it's heat. 
You put up the next slide for me. People back then, they realized that if you looked at the stars long enough, you could learn things from them. In the past, if you pick up on this theme in Genesis, the world was chaos. And God created order by creating boundaries for chaos. This is the, the, the mindset of the Israelite when they, when they read the Old Testament. Chaos and God crea- creates order in this chaos by telling the water where your line stops. By telling the sun when you come up and when you go down. By drawing the rules for the universe. And that is how they saw this. And that is how we see it even up until this day, even with science. Science exists because there's order in the world. That's the only reason why things work, because we can measure what has been done. There are universal rules that are applied to all matter in the universe, and this was designed or picked up by man when we followed the stars. Now, I'm not saying worshiping in the stars. That's why the Bible actually warns about, oh, that's my next slide. 4 verse 19, Deuteronomy 4 verse 19. And be aware lest you raise your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the hosts of heaven, that's a whole new different language right over there. Um, If you want to go check this out again, I'm going to refer you to Dr. Michael Hazer when he talks about a host of heaven. This is phenomenally deep. I don't have time to go into that. You will be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them. Things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. In other words, what they saw was so phenomenal, they began to worship the creation. And Israel came and said, but there's a creator beyond that. There's something bigger beyond that. And we need to be careful because what we see can be so convincing to them back then that it will look like God. And Paul comes and he says, no, no, no. And David, what you are seeing is the message of God to say there's more to life than what we imagine. We aren't as big as we think we are. We aren't as strong as we think we are. We are insignificant. And I'm going to talk a bit about the end about this. But here's the hassle. Why am I sharing all these things with you? Why does God feel so mysterious? I've wondered this many times. Why doesn't God just pop up, say, hello, here's my email address. You can come and see me, and I will make an appointment with you, and it will be convincing. It's, it's, it's difficult questions to, to handle, and, and this is not a theological. It's more philosophical. If they are pronouncing it probably wrong, but it's, it, it touches more on philosophy where we're sitting and thinking. We're like old men sitting back thinking about things in life. But, but why does God feel so mysterious? Here's another thing. Why was it so difficult for the Jews to believe in Jesus when he showed up? You can you carry, carry on with the slides. They, they knew the scriptures. Yeah. They knew it. They, they knew the prophecies. They were expecting a triumphant divine ruler. They were reading the text. So in other words, just, just, let's just rewind. Space, this bigness, this mysterious mysteries out there that NASA is writing about. And now we see Paul referring to the heavens as a, as a display, as a communication from God to say, listen, something bigger is happening and we're struggling. Where is God? Where is God? And God is mysterious and weird. And then Jesus shows up and we don't believe he's God even though we read the text because God is mysterious. He's I think is the right word, cryptic. I think that's the English word. It's, it's almost like these riddles, but why on earth does that happen? Look, look at this line. The profile of the suffering servant was hidden in the text. Okay, I, 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 wanna, I, wanna, I want you to pick up on this idea of mysteries the whole time. The idea that the divine ruler of God coming to earth had to suffer was not common knowledge. When people read the Old Testament in Jesus' time, it was not obvious that a Messiah was going to come and die. It was obvious that a son of David will rule and the nations of the earth will follow Yahweh. And there will be power and authority and righteousness. And the Jews are looking at Jesus and saying, what is this? And if you think it was only the rulers of the time, it was his own disciples as well. 
Can you imagine that God is trying to explain something to us? And while he's explaining it slowly, we still don't get it. God is mysterious. And he did that with Jesus. And the Bible is not even hiding that fact. It's just one of those things that we need to make peace with. We, I, I don't know why. I don't have an answer for Okay, I have a, I have a theory, but I, mean, I don't want to talk about synthetic things. Yeah? But I want to stick to <laughs> the notes. They still did not understand even after the resurrection. You see a man die. You see him being resurrected. resurrected and you still have no idea what's happening. They were just glad that Jesus was resurrected. But Jesus did not do a publicity stunt. It wasn't for marketing purposes. There was something that he wanted to share. And we pick this up in Luke 24 verse 25. Jesus being raised from the dead and he's walking with the two men on the journey. Okay, I've preached about this before um, and I'm almost finished. And he said to them, oh foolish ones, Jesus, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Remember, the two men walking on the road, Jesus appeared to them and they did not know it was Jesus. Okay, off his resurrection. And, and they're speaking about this, this guy from Nazareth that they thought was going to be the Messiah. But he died. And this is where Jesus pops up and he speaks. Next verse. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? For us, he's like, ah, oh, yeah, Jesus suffered. No, no. They had no idea. Jesus is revealing to them the mysterious message in the Bible. He's revealing to them something that was concealed. We know the end of the story. They did not. It was hidden. Okay, get on. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he, what, interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Jesus is explaining to the people what is standing in the Bible because they had this different mindset. And after Jesus began to explain this to them, the church began. Because Jesus had to reveal the secret of God. Amen. Why do you guys look so confused? This, I like, this is like sci-fi mystery. All in, in any case, this was not the only mystery in the Bible. Okay? God does things cryptic. I have no idea. Okay, again, I have an idea, but we're not going to talk about that this morning. Look at Ephesians 3. It's, it's, it's going to pop up again. Now, remember... First of all, the suffering of Jesus was a mystery because they did not expect. That's why they struggled to believe because the Messiah died. And where do you find that in the Bible? Now I know you're going to give me like a quote from Isaiah, but it wasn't obvious because that's not messianic text. It became messianic text after Jesus explained it. So what Jesus did after his resurrection was show them the hidden idea of what's taking place in the Bible. I think Dr. Michael Laser explains it like a, what's the word? Um, mosaic. It's when it's all these individual small tiles, but when you walk back, it makes a picture. Now, that's why it refers to it as the messianic profile, the suffering servant profile, because it was supposed to be a divine ruler, but it was a suffering servant. We see God speaking in the stars. We see God being on earth with Jesus, but everything is clouded to our mind. And Jesus explained it, and then there's a little bit of a, yeah, we know what's going on, you know, a little bit. And the church began. I mean, we don't understand half of the stuff, and Jesus took over the world in any case. Yeah. Any case, okay, we're going to talk about it a little bit later. Now Paul is writing in verse 2, and I would love to speak about these individual words, but I can't. <sighs> For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you, gentlemen, I would love to speak about that, but assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace let me just pause there I'm going to say this God's grace has been gifted to us and us inside the church we are stewards of that grace we are not owners of God's grace we are not judges of God's grace we are stewards of the grace that has been extended to us. Let's just finish what I want to talk about. Verse 3. Assuming that you, um, yes, how the, again, the mystery was made known to me by what revelation? This was not obvious. As I have written briefly. Next one. 
When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery. Again, you hear this mystery, this hiddenness, this, this cloud of unsurety that's taking place over and over and over again. Um, the next one. Which was not made known to the sons of... Again, the language here is deep. It runs into the Old Testament. The sons of men in other generations, and it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Again, Paul is just highlighting how mysterious this is, and few people knew about this. Verse 6. This, yeah, noch again, okay. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and members of the same body and partakers of the promise. So here's the thing. Not only is God mysterious in the Old Testament, when Jesus came, it was mysterious. And here's the biggest thing. Us being included into the, the nation of Israel, if I can use that figuratively, is also a mystery. It doesn't make sense how Gentiles can be reconciled to Yahweh because Israel's are the special ones. The children of Abraham. You will pick this up over and over and over again in the text. If you think God is mysterious in our time, people in the Bible have been writing about the mysteries of God since the beginning. And we need to make peace that this is how God does things. And I don't have answers. I don't, I don't have answers. I don't have solutions. I get frustrated because I get ideas. But why doesn't God pop up? That? This is just how He does this. But I can take two truths from this entire story about looking into space, seeing the vastness of space, this idea of a suffering Messiah that wasn't that obvious, this idea that Gentiles can be reconciled. There's two things that I want to. Not scream at you now. Number one, even though the context was different in our time to them, the conclusion was exactly the same. Let me explain it to you this way. Without technology, when Israel looked up to heaven, they saw Yahweh. When they looked into the sky, they saw their God that created the heavens and the earth. Our context is different today, but for some reason, my conclusion have not changed. I'm not, I don't want to be ignorant. I don't want to be silly. I respect the, the intellectual minds out there. I understand that there's phenomenal scientists out there. And when they speak, I don't want to just rub it off and I don't want to just exclude what they're saying. But even with the things that they are revealing, the larger they reveal the universe, the bigger I understand that I don't understand God. They are showing us how old the earth is. My brain cannot understand this. And they are saying, you see, your Bible is wrong. What I'm saying is, no, we're reading it wrong. And God is bigger than what we would like to put Him in a box. Our minds cannot understand. We can't figure things out. We are trying. And God has blessed us where we can progress and grow and develop and look at the world and try to figure things out. But I'm going to tell you one thing today. That throughout history, you can never be on the wrong side of history when you follow God. There was a time when the scientific community was wrong. But the people who still believed God was right. Today, science figures out that, man, scientists was wrong in this and wrong in that. Yes, there's a lot of things that they did right. But I'm trying to explain something. And whatever the scientific worldview is today, for some reason, my mind can't see past that someone too big for me did something to show to us that we are small and insignificant. And here's the point, number two. That as insignificant as we are, God still keeps on choosing us. This is what the Bible is telling us. Your theology is wrong. Um, you are stupid. You're arguing about color of churches and if you should have lights. And God is saying, man, forget about this. Thing. Look at this place and understand that in this magnificence, the Bible is shouting at us and says, God is choosing us over and over and over again. And people have been writing about this, how they experience the world. And this is too much for me to understand. That in this magnificent universe that we live in, God cares about you and me. Out of all the people in the world, we 
are his children. We are his image bearers. He still chooses us and he still loves us. I don't know. Things hurt in life. Things are messed up in life. And the universities out there are shouting a lot of things. All I can say is that the message has been the same. Irrespective of whether we had technology or not technology, God loves us and we matter to him. And just that statement doesn't make logical sense in my mind. Because we mess up this place. We mess up each other. We mess things up in our world. And God still chooses to send yeah. Jesus. So is God mysterious? Well, our Bible says definitely. Yeah. And you're going to be arrogant if you think you're going to figure things out. As if you can understand the ways of God. The Bible even speaks about that. Who can understand His ways? Who can walk where He walks? Who can tell the sun when to come up and when to go down? We don't have control over these things. I just want to extend this to you. We are not supposed to be scared of science. Because the only thing that science can do is show us what our God did in this world. We are not supposed to be scared. If you are scared of things, then I am concerned about the spiritual condition. Because you might be holding on to a fairy tale inside the church. Uh, that's a topic for another day. I don't know if you guys find this interesting, but this just blew my mind. And watching these images, seeing how far things are, seeing how, 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 how old the universe is. And it again just realized that, man, God giving us these hints, giving us these suggestions. God speaking through nature to us. God sending his son. And now we are the church. And we are the one that needs to be this message, this stewards of God's grace out there in the world. That's your task and my task. I do not know why things go wrong in our life, and I do not know why God pops up and He shows up. But I do know that the message of His love has never changed since the beginning. Even when He wanted to give up, He popped up again. Even when He divorced His nations, made a plan to be reconciled. The guy, sorry, I don't want to mean guy in a, in a disrespectful way, but just to illustrate the example. The guy who did nothing wrong made the plan to be reconciled with a party that did everything wrong. That's God. That's what the Bible says God is. That's what we experience in our lives. Yeah. And we have the responsibility to extend that. So this morning, in a beautiful tone of voice, I want to tell you, we are all useless. <laughs> we are all insignificant. This life is like a, it's like a braid, blade of grass. It's here today, and someone cuts it off, and they're not going to have fever, and then it's gone tomorrow. You know? it's, it's like a small little flower. It's like a shadow. Our life is just like a breath of air. All these things are in the Bible. And things are mysterious, and things are confusing, but I want to encourage you, pursue God. Run after God. God, just look up at the stars and go read NASA's website and you tell me what you see. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your faithfulness in our lives. We declare that you are our God and we serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Our prayer is that this word that went out this morning may plant seeds in our hearts that will produce fruit, that will benefit those around us, Father. May you make us healthy. May you make our theology healthy. May you make our attitude healthy. May you make our hearts healthy so that we can be the light and salt that you deserve. May we be good representatives of this phenomenal message that you have been shouting out to the world for generations. We pray that in Jesus' wonderful name. And everyone says, Amen. Amen.